confinement feeding, whether in a feedlot or in paddock situations, supplementary sort of feeding situation. I just want to run through some basic principles um, of some do's and don'ts, pros and cons of the confinement feeding systems. Just a bit of background about myself. Uh, I spent 27 years with New South Wales DPI. Um, had been out private as a sheep consultant for the last two years. Most of my work during my time with the public service was on feedlotting systems. Um, and yeah, it's carrying through, certainly carrying through over the last couple of years. So today we've got the confinement feeding, a tactic for dealing with the false break. <clears throat> Bear with me, I seem to be having a bit of problem getting on to the next screen. So I'd like to ask first and foremost, you know, what your views are on what a confinement feeding is. To my mind, there are either on-farm sacrifice paddocks and or the traditional feedlot type systems, which are pretty well used to improve environmental, your pasture base, economic and your livestock production efficiencies. We're going to talk a bit about improving the production efficiencies as we go through. There's some um, fairly strong requirement for meeting those heavily pregnant, late pregnant or lactating ewe requirements at this time of year in particular. What are the pros of confinement feeding? Big pluses, uh, you'll generally reduce your stocking rate um, by localising animals in a smaller area. That helps to preserve your topsoil, ground cover and nutrient losses. Importantly, by confining animals where they're not out trying to graze, using body reserves, uh, you can save anywhere from 10 to 15 percent of their actual feed requirements, which can be a huge saving when it comes to pricing out the grain. Confinement feedings can also be used to maintain or improve your core breeder and your perennial base, pasture base. Uh, will certainly help when it comes to getting a bit of rain and your pasture response rates after that rain. Um, by being able to maintain a little bit of ground cover prior to rain. You can certainly look at maintaining and improving body weight and condition score of your breeding stock in particular. Can maintain or improve lamb growth rates or feed conversion efficiencies. Help with you and lamb survival and importantly for the merino based operations, the lamb's lifetime wool quality and cut, principally, principally by trying to meet the use actual energy requirements in late pregnancy and that impact on the lamb's wool quality and cut from then on in. Another area we'll have a little bit of a talk about is the importance of trying to maintain or improve your wool quality, particularly when it comes to position of break and stable strength. You need to be really mindful of uh, your contingency plan, if you like, for when you release animals from a confined area um, onto a green pit or, or green pastures, and we'll talk a bit about that as we go through. Other pros can be your meat market specifications, principally for finishing lambs, or if you've got the numbers and you're looking to offload some mutton, well, the mutton prices at the moment are fairly good. Um, look at value adding your grain, uh, which is a big plus in a lot of these systems, particularly if you have lower value grain uh, and the like on farm and importantly the animal welfare side of it by you know, meeting an animal's requirements, providing the best possible feed uh, or nutrition, water um, and environment. There are some cons, it can be costly particularly when you're looking at full production rations um, and the infrastructure costs of setting up. To be honest, I tell most of my clients it doesn't have to be pretty, you've just got to be functional. So you make do with the basics, you don't have to spend a lot of money on infrastructure. Other negatives potentially can be health issues such as acidosis, ammonia toxicity, pulpy kidney, pink eye, salmonella, coccidiosis, milk fever, it goes on. There are heaps of issues there that uh, you potentially can run into problems with in a confined area. A lot of these you would also have though um, out in a paddock situation. Water quality and supply, absolutely critical. 
um, and there's always an issue this time of year with uh, water quality, um, particularly if you're using dams um, for supplying water to a confined area. Um, it really is a critical issue. You need to have good supply and high quality water if those animals are going to perform. Some do's. Monitor your use body condition. Um, those people who have been involved in Lifetime U program, um, by all means would have a, a, a fair handle on being able to condition score and meet the requirements of those used at certain stages of production. I'll just mention now that at the end of this presentation and in the uh, handout that we'll have on the Sheep's Back website um, of the presentation, there are a lot of links um, and resource material uh, included in this presentation and one of those is how to look into the Lifetime U program and the pros and cons or the benefits of using it. You meet your feed requirements, that's critical this time of year for those late pregnant or early lambing ewes. It's important to monitor those animals when confined, monitor intakes, monitor health issues, uh, monitoring manure and we'll take you through that process as we go through. It's critical that you minimise that acidosis slash grain poisoning risk. Um, it can cause a lot of issues. Um, there are ways and means around it. Uh, it really is, though, a take it easy approach, um, don't rust things, and make sure we have a, a, a good balanced ration with the necessary additives, uh, particularly those that can minimise that acidosis risk. You need to provide a balanced ration with a minimum of 10 to 15 per cent effective fibre. And I'll go into the detail with that again a little bit later on, but I'm very big on maintaining roughage in these confined systems. Quality water I've already sort of mentioned, and importantly you need to have a plan when you release your stock from the confinement systems, particularly when it comes to minimising the impact on your wall quality, position of brake, stable strength and the like. Some don'ts, don't introduce your grain waste rations too quickly. Don't overstock in those confinement areas. Don't restrict trough allocations. Um, if possible, give them more than the recommended allocated lengths for the, the, the feed allocations in particular. Don't be tempted to release stock too early from, from confinement. I know it's a costly process. You'll have green feed coming away in the paddocks. Um, it really does pay though to maintain them a little bit longer in a in a confined uh, system until you have a decent pasture base to let those animals out onto. Uh, my feelings are that you can lamb in confined areas slash sacrifice paddocks, um, but I really wouldn't do it unless you were stretched. I wouldn't really lamb down twin bearing ewes because the risk of lamb losses due to mismothering are just um, escalate. Some other do's prior to introducing to the confined area. The standards, vaccinate, vitamins A, D and E, possibly B12 and your clostridials. Make sure you use an effective drench, you don't want to be feeding stock that are wormy, um, it causes a few problems. Um, a big issue that, that I'm becoming more and more aware of uh, and in favour of is the possible role of magnesium supplements to help out with not just any energy conversion and the like but also with calming of stock. Um, this photo on the screen at the moment. The girl here is my now 21 year old daughter and one of her friends during a trial I had seven or eight years ago when in the department um, and these pens of lambs that they're actually feeding at the moment with grass in their mouth um, had higher magnesium in their rations. Those, uh, the trial treatment was um, assessed by four different people to, to rate those animals on a one to five scale of flightiness and every single person rated those animals that were receiving higher magnesium in the ration as being uh, a calmer animal. I think it has a, a role to play. When we look at minimising stress, I'm very big on the social stress issues in confined areas. Um, we really need to try and minimise stress as much as possible. We do that by at least giving a five square metres per animal um, in a feedlot situation. I prefer to be honest, to actually provide more more area per lamb or uh, or you, um, but the industry recommendation is five square metres. Um, that can be supported by current graph on your screens, 
which is a live shot live sheep trial conducted at Portland where they looked at the percentage of stock feeding every day over a 12 day period um, at five different stocking rates and when we get around about that five square metres it doesn't look like there's any significant improvement in the percentage feeding um, and we pretty well reach a, a, a limit to, to that. Um, minimising stress both at the feed and water troughs, um, particularly on the feed troughs, this is where trough allocation becomes important. We need to try and minimise the impact of bullies, um, which have a big impact on our shy feeder numbers. Just quickly on, on open trough systems, um, as I just mentioned, adequate trough space may well reduce bullying and shy feeders. The general industry recommendations for single side trough access are 30 centimetres per head. If you have double side trough access, um, we talk around about 15 centimetres per head. If you're lambing in a sacrifice paddock, um, I would recommend that you feed later in the day. The, the industry recommendation is to feed later in the afternoon. Um, that potentially provides the ewe and newborn lambs more time prior to feeding to uh, bond strongly. Importantly, if you're feeding out every second or third day with high grain based rations, be really careful when it comes to the acidosis risk. Just some quick ideas on pen designs and infrastructure. Um, a couple of the resources that are available with this handout of the uh, webinar um, have these sort of designs um, and examples um, in the resource. You can look at these sort of systems, which I don't mind. I don't mind. This is a pen style system with a single um, feeding area, and the idea being that you fill that trough, move one mob onto the trough to feed. When they are finished they go back into their pens, you refill the trough and the next mob come in. Has the advantage of reducing your overall cost of feed troughs, feed trough length. The other systems and these are both for open trough and self feeder systems. Um, external and internal trough options where you can have external troughing and I'll show you some examples in a second. Uh, which is single side feed system, so we need to have around about 30 centimetres allocated trough um, space per animal, or internal systems, uh, which a lot of people will use. Um, they have the advantage of double side feeding, but you also have the disadvantage on most occasions of feeding those troughs or filling those troughs while stock are in the pens. Um, you need to be very careful with, with doing so. Just some examples, um, the ones at the moment uh, are basically conveyor building systems uh, with RHS um, framework uh, where the sheep feed through on a single side. Um, the current one on your screen is a cupped conveyor belt system. The conveyor belt has been split down the centre so he's been able to get twice the trough length out of a roll of conveyor building. Um, and held together with threaded rod. They can then be um, moved wherever, whether it's changing the feed out site in a, a um, pen or paddock um, or moving to another site. For steel type systems you can use, like the photo on your left is a um, C-section type um, feed trough that can be used. Um, or you could look at using something like trim deck um, held together with a little bit of RHS framework and set up on tyres or uh, truck rims or sleepers and the like. And it is important to try and keep those troughs up off the ground, um, at least 30 to 40 centimetres if possible, basically to um, minimise the risk of soiling and the like from sheep. You can look at a tarpaulin or plastic type systems. Um, the photo on the left, these are from the same producer um, where he's using a tarpaulin system. The biggest issue he found there was that uh, he had a lot of um, soiling and the like on that tarpaulin um, and so he went to a system where he actually cupped the tarpaulin up to make a, a trough using strainers at each end, A-frame steel posts um, and some single wires and that really did reduce the amount of soiling and, and waste. Uh, potential waste from using the 
uh, tarpaulin. You can look at plastic or PVC moulding, troughing, um, buying these PVC uh, pipes and the like, splitting them down the centre, again doubling your trough length um, out of that one pipe. You can use self-feeder systems. This is a photo of a, a Cara Lick feeder. Um, self-feeder systems lend themselves more to production feeding for sure and, and not necessarily maintenance, but you can have the open style troughs or a lick feeder type trough. I really don't care if you go back to the old 44 gallon drum type systems and, and even if you use something like this for a creep feed area for the lambs um, during uh, or prior to weaning to push those lambs along with high quality feed. It doesn't have to be pretty, it's just got to be functional. Uh, a lot of people have gone to the use of side delivery bins. Uh, I find these are a fantastic feeder, particularly if they don't need to be moved uh, from spot to spot. They'll give you three to four times the trough length of the commercial feeder and any, anywhere from eight to 16 tonnes storage capacity. Just a little word of warning, regardless of the feeder type, um, make sure that you blank off areas under the troughing or at the end of the feeders that lambs can potentially camp under. Um, if using feeders for lambing ewes, particularly for twin bearing ewes, if they come to have a feed and the lambs camp under the shade, have a bit of a sleep, well that ewe may well take off with only one lamb. General rules of thumb for intakes for production feeding, uh, so this is principally feeding lambs, you can budget on anywhere between 3 to 4 percent of their live weight will be their daily intake. It does depend on the age, weight, the type of ration and the wastage rates. But there's a rough rule of thumb, 3 to 4 percent is the amount fed per day or intake per day. For maintenance, you can budget on between 1.5 to 2 percent of live weight of that animal but it is important to take into account the stage of production. With that, I just want to explain that, I guess, in a, in a, in a graph form. If we look at the graph on the screen at the moment, and we say where the star has just come in is, is basically a dry sheep equivalent, or a dry use requirement, and this is a graph for a 60 kilogram use, so quite a heavy U. If we look at the, the feed requirement at the point of lambing, a single bearing U has 1.7 to 2 times the feed requirement of a dry sheep. A twin bearing ewe at that time has up to 2.5 times the feed requirement of a dry sheep. And at the peak of lactation, which is generally 3 to 4 weeks into your lambing, we are looking at a single bearing ewe having upwards of 2.5 times the feed requirement of a dry and the twin bearing ewes going through the roof where it's physically impossible to get enough grain-based rations or any high energy supplement into them and they're going to have to utilise body reserves. This graph is an older one for sure but it's, it's on the resource, one of the resources that's in the handout from today. It's on page 37 of the Managing Drought booklet. Um, there's also one on beef cattle on the same publication. What we have is down the left hand side is U live weights, we have the energy intake and then we have the kilograms of feed required. If we look and draw a line for a 50 kilogram U receiving a ration that's providing 12 megs of energy which is a fairly high energy ration, so it's a high grain based ration, draw a line through those, that will tell us that that 50 kilogram U needs to maintain body uh, full drought feeding um, amounts around about half a kilogram or so a day of that ration. If she's a 55 kilogram ewe receiving the same ration, she needs 600 grams per day. So that difference in body size or weight alone is a difference of about 10% in feeding rate. We need to take into account though, as for that previous graph, what the requirements are if those animals are, are late pregnant or lactating. This box down the bottom here now, we're saying that for a 50 kilogram single bearing ewe, we'll just work through the process and she needs 540 grams a day, but at late pregnancy, we times that by about 1.7, she then needs 920 grams of that ration a day in a full blown drought situation. And 
if she's in her first month of lactation, she's now looking at requiring 1.35 kilos a day. So a huge increase in energy requirements and feed requirement as you go into late pregnancy and lactation. One system or one um, resource you can use uh, is actually on the Western Australian Department of Ag website. It's a supplementary feeding calculator. I came across this the other week. Um, it's not too bad. It can be used to try and work out your actual grain or feed requirements uh, or needs. I just want to quickly run you through that and use two scenarios. Um, we're looking for all of the both scenarios. A mob of 500 ewes, they're 50 kilograms. They're two to three weeks off the start of lambing. It's a twin bearing mob. Their current condition score is two and a half. We want to target a three condition score, so have them going forward and putting condition on. And you'd understand that it's very difficult given their increase in energy requirements to actually do so. We're running them on a 350 hectare paddock, which has about 25% clover. Unfortunately, this program doesn't give us options other than three different levels of clover, but um, it's the process that I'm really interested in more so than the specifics of some of this um, boxes that we can fill in. We're saying there's around 500 kilograms of dry matter per hectare, which is pretty much just a green pick. Our growth rates are pretty low at only 10 kilograms per hectare per day. We've got the option of, of two feeds going out in a mix. I've selected lupins, given it a 13.2 megajoules energy and we're going to feed around about 70% of that ration as lupins. Option B is a good quality wheat and hay with 9.5 megs of, of energy and 30% of our ration. You then hit the calculate feed button. It will tell you the energy currently being supplied from the pasture base is about 9.5 megajoules. The energy needed, however, for this stage of production is about 21 megajoules per day. So to meet that, we need to feed with this ration 660 grams a day of lupins and 280 grams a day of the wheat pasture, uh, wheat hay. If we change and go back to the paddock feed on offer and change that to 200 grams, uh, kilograms per day of dry matter, use exactly the same lupins and wheat and hay. The energy currently being supplied then from the pasture has dropped from 9.5 down to about 6.5. The energy requirement is still the same, 21 megajoules per day, but we have to increase our feeding rates of lupins from 660 to 840 and our hay from 280 to 360. So that's a handy little program that will give you some idea what your feeding rates will be. You do need to be able to assess pasture feed at the time. Um, but if you were in a, uh, a confined area, feeding area, well, pretty much everything that they're getting, you're supplying anyway. Importantly, and we'll just quickly run through a couple of the grains and the like and the importance of energy and protein. The energy level in the, in the ration intakes um, dictates your growth and finishing results. The form in which the grain's energy is stored, whether it's carbohydrate, which is principally starch in our cereal grains, protein or oil, will influence the energy levels of the total ration, the rumen function and health, um, growth rates and feed conversion efficiencies. It's important to remember that oil has over two times the energy value of starch and the like, but it can impact on rumen function and we generally try to reduce or keep the oil contents below 7 to 8% of total oil in the diet. That doesn't necessarily mean oil that you're adding to the ration, but uh, it's oil component of some of the feed grains you may use. On those grains, if we look at the acidosis risk, um, going from the bottom of the page from lupins, oats, right up to the top to wheat and triticale. The reason wheat, triticale, corn and sorghum are higher in the risk scale for acidosis is because they are generally higher in starch and they're generally lower in fibre. The oats at the bottom end of the scale, our lupins, oats and the like, are lower in starch, higher in fibre, higher in oil. Okay, so oats pretty much is the main one to worry about if we're looking at excess oil in a diet because it can have anywhere from 8 to 15% oil um, contained in the, in, the seed cut, in the seed. Just on to protein, protein's 
is needed for muscle development, appetite, wool production, everything that your merino-based systems in particular really need. Inadequate protein, if we don't have enough protein relative to energy, um, we look at having a reduction in the number of, of bacteria in the gut, so the rumen doesn't work as well as it should. The whole digestive process slows down, intakes can drop off, and it's important that we look at balancing up energy and protein to try and achieve optimum growth or production. To do that, we have with this graph on the bottom axis our energy intake, on the left hand side axis we have the crude protein that we need to have a balanced ration. If we are feeding a 12 megajoule ration and these four lines from the top are a 20, 30, 40 and 50 kilogram lamb, on the same ration intake of 12 megs of energy a 40 kilogram lamb needs around about 14% protein to be a balanced ration but a 20 kilogram lamb needs 16 to half, 17%. That's because those lighter weight lambs have to develop um, structure, frame, uh, muscle. So their, their protein requirements are higher um, than the heavier lambs who have already gone through and, and reached a later stage of maturity. With respect to mature sheep, 50 kilograms and above, generally between 8 to 12% protein is adequate. Um, protein requirements do really peak though um, coming into late uh, pregnancy and, and during lactation where you may benefit from giving upwards of 16% protein in a ration. With respect to fibre, I'm big as I mentioned before of keeping fibre in the system. It stimulates and cleans the room and walls, encourages cud chewing and, and sheep have been trialled and shown to chew up to $35,000 35,000 times a day. That chewing is not just uh, while eating but also the cud chewing. By stimulating that cud chewing through keeping fibre in the system we're producing bicarb of soda um, and a lot of minerals are being recycled throughout the system so we want to stimulate that whole program. It maintains rumen motility, it'll reduce acidosis risk, it actually diverts phosphorus away from the urine and into the manure and that helps with the calcium phosphorus balance. So we all know um, the cereal grains are low in calcium relative to phosphorus and for finisher lambs in particular that calcium deficiency um, and the imbalance can lead to issues such as bladder stones. Um, on the breeding use side it can certainly lead into problems like um, milk fever. A rough rule of thumb, if 40% of your mob are cud chewing at any one time, well then your fibre levels are generally adequate. One way of also checking for uh, fibre levels, whether or not they are um, adequate, is to check the manure. To do that, you look at the colour, consistency and the content. Obviously, pebbled, urea, uh, pebbled manure like this photo shows, there's adequate fibre in the system. If you start to get a to a sort of constituency like uh, wheat picks, um, that may well show that there's a degree of acidosis um, and maybe a lack of fibre. You may well start to see a little bit of grain, whether it's whole or cracked grain coming in the manure. Don't worry a great deal unless it's an excessive rate of grain. Um, a lot of that grain would have been broken down already or utilised. But if you get to the stage where you have mucus, um, gas bubbles and a very runny form of manure, well you've obviously got a subclinical acidosis issue, we've got problems in the hind gut, hind gut um, and there are some particular issues there and it may well be related to inadequate fibre. On the water quality and quantity side, sheep will generally consume between 4 to 6 litres a day. In a pasture situation this time of year though, that may well be reduced substantially uh, because they're getting most of their water requirements from the feed if they're in a grazing situation. If you're in a confined feeding area though, budget on about one and a half to two and a half times the ration intake is what you'll need to have um, supplied per head per day. Quality and supply are critical. It's not a hard and fast rule um, or recommendation but the general recommendation here in Australia is for trough length of water uh, 30 centimetres to start with and then one and a half centimetres per sheet. So pretty much a 2.8 to 3 metre double sided access trough whether it's 
a traditional uh, concrete or plastic trough or the PVC um, troughing that a lot of people do use in Western Australia will pretty well handle around 350 sheet quite comfortably provided the um, the uh, the pressure and the supply is, is up to up to scratch. Intakes will increase if hot weather. We're not seeing that at the moment, but um, or salty intakes, salty diets. I had a uh, uh, salt bush grazing trial a few years ago uh, where I was actually measuring lambs at 35, 40 kilos, drinking up to 13 litres of water a day. Um, or if you have a high fibre ration, it tends to increase the water requirements as well. Keep your troughs raised and in, in as far away from the feed as possible to minimise contamination. Clean them regularly. Uh, really can't state that strongly enough that you need to keep that water clean. If you do have a quality problem, whether it's pH, salt, contaminants, algae, um, by all means try and do something about it. Just a quick example, and these are those PVC um, troughs that most people in feedlots are now using. The photo of the algae on the bottom left is actually taken from a PVC trough from a commercial feedlot that was routinely cleaned every day um, with a chimney sweep broom. And there was still an algal um, growth. Whether or not that was enough to impact on water quality, uh, we don't really know. Um, you could don't sorry don't use um, copper-based uh, blocks to try and treat algae in these low volume systems that can be really dangerous with respect to copper toxicity. I generally recommend people cut off a section of, of plumber's uh, copper pipe and just lay that in the troughing um, somewhere around a foot long of, of the copper pipe sat in the base of the trough will go a long way to reducing um, algal growth. On to the wool issue side. You need to manage the change in nutrition as smoothly as possible um, going into and out of a confinement system. With respect to staple strength, in late pregnancy up to 80% of the protein uh, that the animal is consuming or producing is petitioned to the uterus and there's a decline in the amino acid availability. Amino acids are critical for wool proteins of around about 31% and wool growth can be restricted by up to 40 odd percent. Right, so it's, it's, it's important that we really have that protein levels, um, a good handle on those, uh, particularly for pregnant ewes, late pregnant ewes. If we have an increase in the ewes nutrient demand, such as pregnancy or lactation, if it coincides with a decrease in nutrient supply, now that could be a, the, the paddock feed situation in late summer or autumn, or it may well be that high moisture feed that you've currently got as a fresh pick. Um, it's basically going to be a, a lack of nutrient nutrients available um, in that high moisture feed the, the limiting factor is, is getting enough dry matter into the animal um, because you know we're looking at 70 to 80 percent moisture in that type of feed. If they coincide with fibre diamond and arrows, fortunately um, if you can look at providing a form of bypass protein at this time and that can help to reduce the narrowing of that fibre diameter and minimise the risk of a break. Um, from one of the earlier presentations I've had when I was in DPI and I've just taken this screen which obviously is for the lupins. If you look on the screen and the fibre diameter changed over the year, they found with supplementing with lupins at that time and there wasn't, regardless of the type of bypass protein, whether it was a meal or urea or green feed or whatever, they didn't get much better response than that response shown on the screen with lupins. So that will help. Um, and I would assume that most people would be using a fair portion of lupins, whether it's in a confined area or in a paddock situation, to feed their use. So that bypass protein component uh, that's coming from the lupins um, potentially will help with minimising that, that fibre break. Uh, um, a rapid improvement in feed quality, such as putting them out onto green feed from the confined area, will increase your follicle growth and diameter. That can lead to reduced tensile strength and that break in the fibre. So that rapid change in feed quality, particularly protein, um, is a big issue when it comes to um, that break in the fibre. So be very mindful when you release the sheep from a confined system um, going onto a green pick or green pastures. Um, just a quick note, thinning of the fibre can also be due to sickness, disease or a rise in body temperature and acidosis is a major cause of all of those. So it, uh, you may well have the feed in order 
um, and reducing that impact on the fibre diameter, but other issues such as sickness, disease and, and the like, mainly from acidosis, can um, cause the same problem. Be careful with dust, mud and vegetable matter. Um, it's admittedly more of an issue if you have long wool um, animals in the, in the confined areas or higher stocking rates with respect to mud. Um, that's why I like to give a little bit more area so we don't have as many issues with pugging and the like uh, if we get some wet weather. On the vegetable matter side, um, hay racks, like the cattle style hay racks where lambs will actually eat from below the bale line, um, I find are particularly good, uh, not just for getting vegetable matter into the wool and particularly around the back of the neck, but also if it's not reasonable quality um, hay, we can have big issues with dust, grass seed and the like and some problems with um, ink eye. With respect to supplements, um, both in the confined area and upon release, grain. Um, we need to keep the energy levels up. That also has a component there with the fibre. Bypass protein, as, as we've just discussed. Bentonite. A lot of people would use bentonite anyway in a uh, feedlotting system, but bentonite's a clay. It's not a true buffer, um, but it actually acts in a couple of different ways. Um, it'll reduce protozoa number. Now, protozoa actually consume a lot of bacteria in the rumen and rumen bacteria are a big source of our protein to the animal. Um, it'll bind, protect and release amino acids in the small intestine. Um, it'll slow the gut passage down. That improves the nutrient use from the ration and reduces the risk of scouring. And it's been shown that it can actually increase wool growth by up to 13%. So bentonite is one that we probably look at having in there as a supplement. Cobalt or vitamin B12. B12 is essential for the conversion of, of our acids into glucose, essential for wool production and the metabolism of methionine, which is a major amino acid of the wool. Um, generally, we don't see a lot of cobalt deficiencies in the, in the um, in New South Wales, the eastern states. It's mainly on very light, sandy soils. However, um, young lambs uh, whose room is not fully functional um, or fast grass or cereal-based pastures in particular can be low in cobalt. Cobalt is a precursor to vitamin B12, so probably does pay to um, consider giving B12 supplements. Provide additional fibre. It's not just the advantage of keeping that rumen going and working efficiently, but it helps with vitamin B12 absorption uh, because that B12 absorption is enhanced by slower gut flow. Just basic um, mineral requirements. Magnesium, calcium and salt, both um, in the feedlot or confined area or out in, into the pastures when you release them. Um, magnesium, calcium and sodium um, are generally low in cereal grains, um, green grass or grazing cereals. Um, and there have been some very good trial results coming out of the Grain and Graze um, program where they've looked at supplement trials and the impacts on growth rate and production. Uh, if you want to uh, in, in include some magnesium additives, cause mag or dolomite or a product called acid buff which is used by most pellet manufacturers now. It's actually a seaweed extract that will release both calcium and magnesium into the system. Um, it's also a very good buffer. Uh, it buffers around about four times better than bicarb of soda. For, using, for, for providing calcium, um, ag lime, the calcium carbonate is the preferred choice or again something like acid buff. For sodium, um, obviously salt or perhaps sodium bicarb will help meet those sodium requirements. Um, just a, a note there on the screen that uh, I'm not covering it today in the webinar but it is actually in the uh, handout um, form on the website, uh, a list of commonly used additives, uh, particularly when feeding high grain based rations. Important in the last thing is, is you need to control worm burdens. If we have damage to the room and all the small intestine, that also inhibits B12 absorption. And again, B12 is important for energy production. Okay, just a couple of quick things on what I consider to be the best practice management um, procedures if lambing in confined areas, if you are going to lamb either in a feedlot or a sacrifice paddock. Definitely look at scanning used for litter size. Separate those twin bearing ewes at least four weeks prior to lambing. Preferentially feed those ewes at least one and a half to two times the requirement of a dry sheep. 
Single bearers, to my mind, particularly in a hard season, can be fed as a dry ewe, right, up until you know, a week or two prior to um, lambing. Um, and then we look at supplementing after that. A single bearing ewe has got a, a greater potential of keeping that lamb alive and not having too many um, health issues, provided they don't fall below a, a condition score or a fat score value of about 2.5. I'd look at separating your early and late lambs by checking the others closer to uh, when the first lamb's due and preferentially feed your early lambing ewes. They're the ones that are going to need it earlier than the others. If you need to, you could leave those out in a sacrifice paddock situation and in the feedlot have those later lambing ewes so you can continue to build up their body reserves. Um, if lambing single bearing ewes, with an uh, confined area, reduce the mob size, give them more space. Um, I'd, I'd be looking at a maximum of 80 to 120 ewes per pen, provide at least 30 square metres, upwards of 100 square metres of ewe if possible. Uh, ensure you've got plenty of trough space. If possible, I'd look at drift lambing. Um, so uh, either taking them onto the unlamb ewes onto a, a, the next pen or lambing the one, sorry, drift lambing the ones that have lambed within a day or two, once the lambs are well bonded, taking them out of the system. Uh, with respect to lambing twin bearing ewes, um, definitely look at larger paddocks. I wouldn't look at a feedlot situation. And as I mentioned before, the the, um, the impact on lamb survival is just, just huge uh, because of the mismothering aspects. Um, I'd probably look at broadcasting lupins um, or any pulses throughout those paddocks. So, you know, as they graze anyway, they're going to try to graze, they'll pick up a fair portion of their daily requirement. I'd probably look at using self-feeders. I'd spread them out um, so the lambs and the ewes don't congregate in one point um, and cause mismothering problems. Again, blank off um, around and under those feeders so the lambs don't camp, camp there. Um, and also spread those self-feeders out. Uh, get them out in different spots. Uh, why I prefer to use self-feeders self is that we all know the problems with trail feeding and use rushing to a, um, a feed trail. So we try to mitigate or reduce that risk. Just quickly, when releasing stock from confinement, we've got a minute or two to go. Don't let stock graze at high quality or high moisture pasture on an empty stomach. Do it slowly. Introduce them slowly, even if it means letting them onto the pastures for an hour or two a day Initially, allow the room and time to adjust. Um, you know, a wool break, nitrate poisoning, scouring, poppy kidney, preg tox, a lot of your good work can be undone um, by rushing it too quickly to put them out onto pasture. If the ewes are late pregnant or lactating, continue to supplement for at least a week to 14 days to try and reduce the impact of that feed quality change or Continue feeding until pastures are able to meet their requirements with a minimum target requirement of 1,200 kilograms of dry matter. And just quickly wrapping up, I'm a bit mindful of my battery on my phone, sorry, but wrapping up, um, minimise acidosis risk. Provide a balanced ration with a minimum of 10 to 15 percent effective fibre. Be mindful of social stress during the introduction and the feedlot stages. And also the impacts of, of space has, um, whether it's um, the space allocation per head in the pen or whether it's feed or water trough um, allocation. Water again, quality and quantity critical. And have a plan for when you release your stock from that confined system. Um, I'm finishing up there with that. We'll take some questions. Uh, on your screen at the moment is just the list of resources that I'm providing with the handout. Um, by all means, uh, download whatever you need to from those resources um, and I'm quite open to taking any inquiries at all um, after we finish today. Thank you. Any questions? All right, thanks for that, John. I think um, pretty timely presentation given what's transpired over the last six weeks in WA. Uh, most of the state seems to have had a pulse break, so even though there's rain forecast this weekend, it's not actually, yeah, the past has died, so it needs to start again. So there's some tactics that you went through that could help quite a few producers. Does anybody got any questions? 
for Jeff on that. I've got one question here for Jeff. Yep. Jeff, Mike Hyder from Albany, thanks very much for that. I enjoyed that presentation a lot. Just, just a query on you, you had um, effective, um, effective fibre, or roughly yep. underlined a few times. Can you just expand on that? It, yeah, it's really that I mean, scratch factor. Well, yeah, it's really the scratch factor component. Um, for example, if you were going to feed silage out, I'm not a big fan of feeding silage um, to lamb, say, in particular, in a feedlot type situation, mainly because the high moisture content and that fibre isn't that rough scratch type factor. Uh, and again, that's the big issue we have when we have high moisture feed or pasture bases. We don't have that hard roughage. Um, to be quite honest as well, with a lot of the um, feedlotting work we do, in the eastern states at least, um, first couple of weeks we would probably use good to high quality um, roughage like loosened haze, clover haze, cereal haze. Um, but during the finishing um, or the feedlot stage we'd, we'd go to straws. Um, and it's re really just to provide that roughage component, that, that scratch factor. Um, it, it basically works by you know, stimulating the room and walls to release digestive juices, keeps the room and walls clean, um, stimulates that cut chewing um, and yeah, recycling a lot of the, the minerals. Thanks. If I could make one more comment then. Yeah. I was yep. pleased to see you using the um, uh, sheep feed calculator that was put together by Mandy Kurnow and others. Just just a comment on your comment that uh, 500 kilos of green feed at this time of year is is barely a pick, um, or is just a, a, a yep. green pick. In actual fact, it's 500 is is quite a lot of foo over here in the establishment phase, purely because it's all water and there's very little lignin. So um, uh, the cuts. I've sent some photos around, which I'm happy to to send to anyone else that wants them. I'm doing them fairly regularly and it shows that, you know, a, a, a bare green pick is more like, you know, 100 kilos a day or 100 kilos of, of dry matter per hectare. So 500 looks like an yeah. enormous amount of pasture, all I'm saying at this time of year. Yeah. Oh, look, I'd agree. I'd agree. Um, to be honest, I think that's a great little program. There's a, I guess one of the issues I, I felt with it was that um, we didn't have options other than three different clover levels, so we couldn't just go on a, on a, a grass or cereal-based system. Um, sure. And I actually, I actually thought, given the dry matter that I put in at 500 kilograms per hectare, then the 200 kilograms per hectare, to be honest, I actually thought the uh, energy that it was estimating was probably a little bit higher than what was available, which would just pretty well mean that you, you need to take that into account and maybe up your feeding rates of grain a bit higher. A bit higher. I think it's a great little program. I only sure, came across it two weeks ago. Yeah. We, I guess we developed a lot of that stuff and spent a fair bit of time looking at the WA scene and working with Mike Freer and co on grass feed and all the foo by height relationships. So we've, we've adapted it very much to the Western Australian, you know, clover dominant passes, mm -hmm. if you like, even though 25% is, is far from dominant. But um, for a lot of our passes, it was rare to have, you know, grass dominant like you do over east. So, um, all right, yep. As I say, we've modified it to try and suit our, and, and different to over east, we also find that there are different relationships between foo and height during the establishment period and then during the vegetative period and then particularly during the spring period. So um, calibrating for foo is, is one of the things that we we try and get through, especially at this time of year where the, the tendency, and I'm the worst at it, I'm still in spring mode and I might be calling something 500 when in fact it's only 150 because it's just full of water. So anyway, it was a, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see you, you, you and, and like it. Yeah. I think it's great and look, to be honest, I struggle at times with my lifetime year groups um, when we look at estimating pasture and it really pays to cut, really pays to cut it and go through the process of working out what's actually there.
Yes. Yeah, Jeff, there's a question in the chat box. Uh, could you explain a bit more about the oil content of different grains and what effect this has on the rumen? Yep, yeah, okay. Um, the oil content, well, if you look at your wheat, your triticale, uh, the like those high risk ones that are up there, well, they tend to have only 2 or 3 percent oil. As you go down the list, we tend to have more and more oil um, in those grains. So barley, I think from memory, is about 5 or 6 percent oil. And as I mentioned, your oats might be down to 10 or more. oats might be 10 to 15 percent oil. Oil is, has got over two times the energy value of starch, but it hasn't got the health or the acidosis type risk with it. That's why, to my mind, barley is the pick of grains. Um, it's not as high in starch, but it's a bit higher in oil. It's a little bit higher in fibre, um, and the the energy values aren't really that far away from our wheat, triticales, corns, um, because even though we've got slightly less starch, it's because of that oil component. So there's some certain adva definite advantages to having oil, uh, sorry, grains that are lower in starch but are providing a fair bit of energy through things like sugars or oils, um, and that's why lupins is, is re relatively also safe because it's got a low starch component, but a lot of the energy is coming from sugar and oil. That answer the question? Yeah, I think so. That was from Katie. So I think, um, yes, yes, thanks. You're right. Yes, thanks. So, um, is there any, if there is any more questions, there's also a short survey that I've posted in the chat box. I just asked how, a couple of questions on how you um, found access today was, um, whether it was easy, hard, or what sort of issues you might have had in accessing the webinar. Uh, could you fill that out? That would be um, much appreciated. Uh, like I said before, this presentation has been recorded and will be on the website. Uh, should be up early next week. Um, if you require a copy earlier, uh, just email um, email us. And, yeah, we're more than happy to send that through early, but it'll be up next week. Have we got any more questions? Not a question, just another comment. Mike Hyder from Albany again. Jeff, um, there's a, a chap over here, um, Cameron White, I think is his name, and he feedlots lambs. And I was very struck when I heard him present, you know, five or six years ago, that his indicator for mental health for the lambs that he's finishing, he puts a bale of hay, uh, always has a bale of hay in each of the feedlots that I think from memory holds a thousand lambs. And when he doesn't see them jumping on and off the hay bale, he knows there's something wrong. And I thought that was a very... I, I thought he was putting it there for feed. Um, but in fact, it was more like a, um, a, a play thing, if you like. They knocked it down, broke it down, and it warmed up. So it was almost like central heating as well. But primarily, it was a, a, uh, a, a mental health thing, which I thought was better. Yeah, I think, it's, I think that sort of thing's great. Um, there's been a little bit of work looking at the impacts of enriching the environment for sheep and cattle. We don't see anywhere near the results that, um, from one trial at least, that was done on goats in Queensland. Um, but there are some significant results there from providing an enriched environment. Um, I mean, the swans so big on the social stressing. We're changing their whole structure and we're putting them into a foreign foreign environment. Let's give them things to play on. Let's leave logs in there. Let's leave. You know, balls or soccer balls or tyres or whatever for them to use and play because, you know, that late afternoon, the Lamb Olympics is sort of running around that four or five o'clock in the afternoon having a great time. And I think it's got a lot to do with, with productivity for sure. Keep them happy. Mm. Well, if there's no more questions, uh, we might close it off there. Thank you very much, Jeff, for your time. Um, yes, that was a good presentation to have uh, after the start, such a good start in WA to turn into a fox break. So there's some key points there for anybody thinking of uh, confined feeding their sheep. Um, yeah, and that presentation will be up soon so you can get more or you can contact Jeff directly. So thank you everybody for attending.
Um, I'll just leave it open. Um, I'll post that link again for anybody that didn't get to it to fill out our survey. And I'd just like to once again thank you all for attending. Cool. Very thank good. you, Mark. Thank you both. Very. Thanks, everyone. Cool. Can you still hear us, Mark? Mark, where's the um, where's the survey? Um, it's in the chat box, which um, is on the bottom right hand corner of your menu. Yep. Yep. So, can you click on it? Uh, that's the I can see it. Gotcha. It's a survey. Gotcha. Mark. Right. -o. Thank you. Can you hear me there, Mark? It's Jeff. I can hear you. Yeah, mate. Look, thanks, Mark, for that. I'll, I'll catch you later. My battery phone's really beeping over here, so I'm going to lose internet connection soon. So thanks, mate. I'll we'll catch up. Yeah, no worries. Thank you very much for that, Jeff. Good morning, Mark. Norm Turner, just testing. Oh, First yeah. webinar. Yeah, how you going, Norm? Yeah, I can hear you well. Beautiful. Thank you. I would talk about pallets. I would talk about cutting machinery to mix, uh, to do a mixed ration, but I think we don't have time. We've got rain coming here and it's seeding, so I better get going. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Well, good luck with the rain. Thank you.